Mr. Speaker, I will be supporting this amendment. I have Amendment 27, which is pretty much identical, except it gives us veto powers in addition. Um, in regards to this uh, amendment, um, without this amendment, the bill att att attempts to subvert the Constitution, undermining the governor's emergency powers. And uh, this authority is given to him under Article 1 and the Disaster Act 2623.0.010, which clearly states that the governor declares the disaster emergencies. And um, it's really important to note that this is only 30 days. He was only given 30 days. And someone said, well, the governor can, can stop and declare, you know, stop declaring these emergencies. But we've seen that that is not the case. He, it should have only been 30 days from March 11th to uh, April 11th. But then it, it went on through November 15th and then uh, December, then January. And now all the way, this bill does it all the way to the end of December. So I will be supporting um, this amendment. Um, and I will tell you that uh, the, the previous speaker did a very good job um, speaking to this issue. But I'd also like to say that these mandates, orders, and regulations cannot violate the supreme law of the land, which is the United States Constitution. And I also want to echo his comments in regards to the no-bid procurement. That is outrageous. So I want to thank uh, the, the sponsor of this amendment. And um, I fully support this, and I will be voting yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this amendment, in essence, strips out all of Section 4, which is commonly known as the Disaster Declaration Light. Uh, this is a tool that the governor has asked for. It provides a more narrow authority than a disaster declaration in the event that that occurs, that we need this. It is similar to what the state of Michigan has done, what our previous speaker has mentioned. And uh, it does make sure that we keep the SNAP benefits going for about $8 million a month. It keeps the Medicaid and Social Security waivers and it keeps our ability to manage the vaccine uh, moving forward. That's very important, and I will not be supporting this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, and I echo the comments of the previous uh, speaker as well. I will be supporting um, amendment number 11. People have had enough with this COVID disasters. They've been a year and a month now. They're done. Alaskans are done. So I find absolutely no need for the disaster declaration. I think that echoes um, the governor as well, the, excuse me, the administration. Um, I just want to make a quick comment about India. If you dig deep in the research, uh, they're real low on vitamin D levels. And I think we must focus on healthy levels of vitamin D, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. A lot of people fear losing their businesses. They fear losing their rights. They fear uh, their children losing their mental health and education. We do need to be in recovery mode. And um, with that, I, I believe the administration could have the tools under you know, some of the federal relief areas and this disaster declaration is not needed so i will be supporting uh, amendment number 11 and i thank the member for bringing it forth mr president i move in opposition arise in opposition to this amendment now, clearly this is a worldwide pandemic it's pretty hard to argue it's not there's thousands and thousands of people dying all over the planet every day the country the united states of america has a countrywide declaration of disaster canada our neighbor has our virtual borders sealed off. They have problems that Alaska doesn't have as far as the inability to get their citizens vaccined um, or their vaccine uh, distributed and effective. My understanding is every state in the union except one has a disaster declaration. I think that's Michigan and they have other tools at their hand that we try to replicate in the bill. So by pretending that there's not a disaster, it's pretty hard to do when it's worldwide and it's countrywide and our neighboring country has got problems. So I would urge the, the Senate to err on the side of being conservative and protect its citizens at all costs from this pandemic. Mr. President, and I will be supporting this um, 
amendment. I think um, the bill as a whole, we, it, it's, it's unbelievable that we're, we're going back and we're, we're retroacting stuff like back in November and December that we didn't look at it back in January, February. I, I find that completely outrageous personally. Um, I think there's serious constitutional concerns with ex post facto issues. And in regards to the departments, we've spoken to some of the departments and they said this is gonna create massive chaos if we go retroactive uh, with lawsuits, with everything. It just, the departments are gonna be in chaos retroactively. So I will be supporting uh, this amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, if the previous speaker could Give me one example of speaking with the department and the uh, identification of where the problems are. Mr. President, I have it. Uh, it's in regards to regulations and in regards to liability. And it, I do have this in amendment at, at a future date. It's in my binder. So I, I need a few minutes to look it up. Thank you, Mr. President, and I will be voting no on this amendment. Um, an original Supreme Court uh, justice did support right to life. The, we are given inalienable rights endowed by the creator at creation. Right to life is the very first one. Maybe this might cost some money in regards to litigation, which of course nobody really wants to, to get deeply, deeply involved, but that the courts are there for a reason and the courts are there uh, to help uh, with disputes. But I will tell you that the right to life of, of the innocent baby and the, is, is just, it's just not worth it in regards to um, the, the amount of money. So if you're, if you're just talking about money here uh, with the previous speaker, what I'm gonna say is yes, the litigation may cost money, but just consider the innocent lives that are lost in the womb and to me, that is just a travesty. So to me, this is worth fighting for. Life is worth fighting for. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the constitutionality issues the uh, sponsor of the amendment referred to uh, pertain to the Alaska Supreme Court. And I'll start by saying that sometimes court rulings um, aren't right. Sometimes court rulings are wrong. Think back to court rulings made regarding slavery uh, that upheld it regarding um, the pro prohibition of women's right to vote. And, and so I would argue that some of the rulings by our state Supreme Court have actually been off the mark and um, that the, their cases, ha they've been in error actually. And you know, there's checks and balances between our branches of government and the checks on the judiciary branch, there are several that can be done. We can change the laws of the legislature. Um, we can impeach a judge, but the third one, not many people talk about, is if the court ruling, if the belief is that it is wrong, you just, you don't follow it. So what, and so I'm gonna just, just put that on the record because um, we're basing this on something that the Alaska State Supreme Court might rule on, but probably more important in this issue is these are federal funds and we have the Hyde Amendment at the federal level and the Hyde of Amendment pre prevents federal, I mean allows um, it bars federal funds from being used to pay for ab abortions uh, that are medically unnecessary. So these, these are federal funds we're talking about. We're not state, talking about state funds. And the cases, I believe, um, that the Supreme Court cases, although just having received this just moments ago, I didn't get a chance to study it, but we were really talking about state dollars through the Medicaid program with some of these cases. And here we're talking about federal funds and we're talking about the Hyde Amendment, that federal law would supersede um, whatever was decided by the Supreme Court as that goes. These are federal funds, not state dollars. Um, so I am um, going to be a, a strong no on this amendment. I move amendment number 27. There's objections, Senator Reinbold. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. President. 
What amendment number 27 does is it deletes the Commissioner of Health and Social Services and, uh, and then it, on uh, line number seven, it allows the legislature to end the declaration and it says it shall adopt a resolution once the legislature based on critical uh, scientific and epidemiological and uh, virological nationally respected peer reviewed research. So this allows us not to kick down the can, you know, kick the can down the road in regards to uh, disaster declarations that are, are impacting our economy, impacting education. It puts us in the driver's seat and it takes the Commissioner of Health and Social Services out of the driver's seat to do the, the public health emergency. Thank you, Mr. President. Wrap up, Senator Reinbold. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to briefly talk about what happened. You guys keep talking about what happened in Michigan. And what happened in Michigan is they went to the Supreme Court and had the mandates struck down at the Supreme Court. I will tell you that they're trying to do this public uh, health emergency through the commissioner now, but that is also in court. It's on, on, on its way to court and creating, and I have all the information here if you guys are interested in looking into it right now, but it is uh, causing serious legal concerns even in Michigan right now. So I'd highly recommend we do not put the commissioner in charge because it will end up in court. Thank you. This basically um, d deals with the retroactivity. So if you deal with retroactivity, the Black's Law Dictionary defines retroactivity. Permission to read, Mr. President? Uh, without objection, Senator Reinbold. Retroactivity is a law that looks backwards or contemplates the past, affecting acts of facts that existed before the act came into effect. I'm going to jump down a little bit. Laws retroactively impose punishment. They raise unique questions under the Constitution, particularly with the respect of ex po facto and the Bill of Attainer clauses. Those provisions and analogies provisions apply to the states. This, they're prohibited enactment of certain laws that are penal in nature regardless of whether they are styled as criminal law. The ex po facto clause contained in Article 1, Section 9, Clause 3 of the Constitution provides no ex post facto law shall be passed. If this is not taken out, this, this amendment, this bill is unconstitutional. We must remove the, re the retroactivity. And uh, I will go on to say um, that uh, the Supreme Court in regard to the ex post facto clauses uh, prohibit is confined to laws respecting um, to, uh, it has no relation to retrospective in regards to um, other uh, description. So the bottom line is we need to deal with this not making this an ex post facto uh, bill. It, I mean, assuming you guys want it passed, I certainly don't want to pass, get the bill. So this, if we don't take this out, it will kill the bill, um, Mr. President. Um, Amendment 29 is a, a personal objection to the administration of the COVID-19 vaccines. It allows uh, personal objections based on um, religious, medical, or other grounds. This is just to put it in, in state statute to pr provide protections to anybody who wishes to wait, you know, or even not uh, have this. It's under emergency use authorization right now. It cannot be mandated at this time, but this just protects all of us to make sure that we're backing, you know, uh, what's in federal law into state statute and, and empowers um, Alaskans. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's my understanding that the vaccination is voluntary now. Is that correct? At this time, under emergency use authorization, they are not allowed to be mandated. However, we have um, uh, circumstances with a native corporation that is uh, requiring it for employment at AIH. Uh, we also have heard um, through the University of Alaska residents are being um, mandated if they stay on campus. We've also heard that um, prisoners 
uh, that are allowed, they're not, they have to be vaccinated to see a lawyer. And, and these are very serious violations of federal law. And so that's why I believe we're protecting ourselves in regards to this. But thank you guys all had excellent questions. Mr. President, I move amendment number 30. There's objections, Senator Reinbold. So uh, Mr. President, what um, amendment number 30 does is it helps empower in regards to informed consent. So a lot of people do not understand uh, the MRA uh, vaccines in general, but um, this is in regards to vaccines in general. And uh, basically what this, this does is it uh, allows, or it, it has the Department of Health and Social Services to have an internet website that reports adverse effects, including medical complications, any uh, behavioral uh, health impacts, injuries, deaths result resulting from the administration of vaccines or other medical devices and policies regarding the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, so this is really, really important uh, so people understand if they do choose to take this, which I am not an anti-vaxxer, I want people to know. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a personal choice. Basically, they just have a website of what's happening in Alaska so they can have an informed consent and be aware if they are having um, problems uh, with this uh, new, and it, it, because it is under emergency use. It's not FDA approved. And so I think this helps with informed con consent and it helps um, back up federal law that requires informed consent. And uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll make it brief. I, actually, this is a very reasonable um, amendment. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of folks are very concerned about taking uh, a vaccine or mRNA treatment that is still under emergency use and doesn't have the years of data we would normally see. So I think a website with information from DHSS would be very helpful to track this data to help people cut through some of that fog on, on reactions that may be seen. It also helps them make informed decisions with their doctor for conditions they may have. So I think this would actually be a very positive step. So I'm going to go ahead and support it. Thank you, Mr. President. So basically what amendment number 32 does is it deletes the approving and ratifying declaration of the public health disaster emergency. Treaties are ratified. This was a brand new maneuver that the, that the uh, Senate ended up doing through the ledge budget and audit process is ratifying expenses that the governor already did. It ended up causing us a, a lawsuit and we ended up coming back here. So basically um, this just deletes that language uh, so we don't end up again in a, a legal situation in the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, bottom line is I was just referring to a memo um, in regards to ratification, um, and interestingly it was from the member from, from downtown, uh, from Megan Wallace, um, that says that em emergency cannot last more than 30 days, and the intent, I just want everybody to know, the intent of this is to make sure that we don't ratify something that was illegal in the first place. So that is my intention. Thank you. So uh, basically what amendment number 33 does is it allows disaster declarations for only 30 days and this allows 90 days for OMB uh, to report on the spending. Thank you. If we do this after 30 days, it will be beyond the 121st date of May 19th. Uh, I don't want to come back here in 30 days to see you guys again. Sorry. <laughs> I like you all, but not that much. So um, I say we keep it as is. Thank you. I move Amendment 34. Object. There's objection. Senator Reinbold. What this uh, basically does is, is uh, Amendment number 34. It requires a report um, starting March 1st, 2021 uh, for the Office of Management and Budget uh, shall submit reports to the legislature to ex uh, do a broader expense expenses. So this uses more of the language from 241. 
And uh, what it does is it also expands uh, the reporting just a little bit in regard to um, the, the report includes uh, information about isolation and quarantining of individuals to help uh, prevent this, the spread of COVID-19. Again, it, it gets the uh, adverse reactions, injuries, side effects, and deaths related uh, to the vaccine, um, definitely for Alaska. And uh, the governor shall submit the final report um, no later than a, a year later, which is, is March uh, 1st, 2022, or 60 days after the governor determines an Article 2 section uh, you know, of the Constitution that the public uh, health disaster no longer exists, whichever is earlier. Thank you. So basically what this does is it just, uh, there's a financing plan in regards to the disaster declaration, and this is a legislative um, uh, appropriation bill. I want all the power of appropriation, all of it, to belong in the legislature's hands, and, and that's the intent of this amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. So um, basically what this, uh, this amendment number 37 does is uh, on online page one, line 17, that a manufacturer of a COVID-19 vaccine that causes injury or the death of a person, it manufactures a COVID vaccine and knowingly, knowingly withholds information about the vaccine that could prevent harm or another person if the information had been released and the withholding of the information causes uh, death of another person. So basically, they would they would uh, it, this would cause criminal criminal penalties. And I will tell you why I think this is so important. I did work for a pharmaceutical company for many years, and uh, there is information that is withheld. And I think that it is wrong. It's it's on file, data on file somewhere, uh, shoved way back. So um, the public doesn't know to ask for this information. And with this, with uh, these new, these are not FDA approved. I think that someone needs to be held liable for these, and uh, this would be a great step in the right direction for those that are making so much money, billions of, of dollars uh, manufacturing these, to be held responsible, uh, especially when they withhold information that could have prevented that um, death. Th thank you, Mr. President. So uh, basically what amendment on number, number um, 38 does, it's, it's in regards to um, relating to the powers of the governor during a disaster and relating to the powers of the municipality. So uh, basically what uh, 39 does is it um, allows legislative supremacy, basically, so that the legislature can terminate a disaster emergency by the majority vote um, or a concurrent resolution. And uh, basically it, it, uh, in, in line 21 on page 1, it says, unless authorized by a majority in the legislature, of the joint session or concurrent resolution, the governor may not declare a condition of the emergency. So this once again emboldens the legislature. I made one promise to this legislature when I when I uh, when I joined um, caucus this time is I want to embolden the legislative branch after a very difficult year of, of a tremendous amount of mandates. And uh, so basically, what this does is um, in, in allows the the legislative uh, the legislature the ability to terminate the disaster declaration and the, and said that the governor cannot declare um, it, uh, regard, regarding uh, the disaster declaration um, in, uh, the, unless authorized by a majority of the members of the legislature in joint session or concurrent resolution, the governor may not declare uh, the condition of emergency. Thank you, Mr. President.